What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and I'm here with uh, Mikhail Thorup. Uh, he's the CEO of Expat Money, and it's a website, and he's a consultant uh, uh, for people looking to move offshore, their businesses offshore, or looking to move offshore for tax reasons and things like that. So um, I got in contact with Mikhail to just discuss everything because, you know, traders, as for traders, I know for myself especially, um, you're looking to like minimize your taxes and all that and explore some opportunities that are available around the globe. Well, you know, in the U.S., we have Puerto Rico um, that that's, uh, you know, tax friendly for traders as well as around the globe. You know, I noticed known myself being an avid traveler, especially like when I went to Dubai this year, I know some traders moved to Dubai Um and I just didn't know much about it. So, uh, you know, I reached out to Mikhail to talk about the opportunities that are available. And because th there are some, you know, I think it's as traders, we we need to be aware of what's available out there to us to kind of figure out what's what's best. What's the best of, op of availability? What's the best opportunity for you um, in your trading uh, journey? You know, so for me, in my trading journey, like I'm already um, kind of established or profitable for a sense and i gotta look for it long term now what's what's the best for me uh to minimize uh the tax burden you know what i'm saying so so yeah so here we go we got mikhail today and he's gonna dive into all that and explain it for us um he's a professional in his field so yeah how you doing mikhail how you doing very good david happy to be here thanks very much for having me on your program Awesome. Awesome. So Mikhail, so how, so let's start with maybe like a background on yourself and your company and how, how you got started with all this. Sure. Um, very, very quickly, my background is, um, well, I might as well do the whole story. So when I was a child, I was diagnosed with a learning disability. And what they ha what happened, David, was they pulled me out of my class and they sat me down in a little room and they said, uh, Mikhail, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is send you to a special school, special school for special boys. And that's what they did. Uh, every day for three years, I got on a little white bus and I took a little white bus across town and I went to this quote unquote special school. Only problem, David, was that it was actually a regular school with a special class. So I used to get in a ton of fights and I used to get picked on and bullied and all kinds of shit. And it was pretty horrible. Now, I'm not a victim by any means, and I don't want to come across as a victim. Actually, I hate that type of mentality completely. I got hit and I hit back. I will not claim otherwise. But uh, after three years of going through this, I had a really bad taste in my mouth for public education. And uh, I got to go back to my neighborhood school. And um, the kids who I thought were going to be so excited to see me and so happy to see me uh, started whispering and gossiping and you probably imagine what happened. You know, they start saying, oh, he went, I remember him, he went to some retard school. 1980s, totally politically correct. You know how kids are. Oh, definitely. Very, very yeah. sensitive, you know, very, very sensitive kids. But um, I really didn't like school. So I stopped going. And when I stopped going, then I started failing. And then somehow I get pushed through and they send me to summer school and then I fail that. And the next year I'd fail that. And long story short, uh, at 12 years old, I stopped going to school. And at 15, I officially dropped out. And I started traveling the world a lot long after that, a couple of years after that. And um, I really saw that there's not only one way to learn things and not only one way to live your life. And I started meeting all these incredible people who were doing things completely different. And I started testing things out with different immigration and tax issues. And I was very libertarian in my thinking right from the very beginning. And I started putting the pieces together. Fast forward now, and I've been at this for 22 years straight. I have visited over 100 countries. I've lived in nine countries, and I've circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. And I mean, I have been traveling. Like, I'm not, you know, do a one-week vacation and then go back home. I mean, I've been moving. Um, I met my wife overseas. My kids were born overseas. We have homes in multiple countries. I run a seven-figure business now, helping other people to go through all of this. And a little side note, uh, my quote unquote learning disability was dyslexia, which is really, we know now in today's day and age, not a big deal whatsoever, but in the 1980s, they didn't understand things and decided that they were going to really uh, change things. 
So that's a bit about me and how I learned all these things. Seven years ago, I decided that I wanted to do this full time. Six, seven years ago, I wanted to do this full time and uh, started building the consulting firm. And now I have 17 people who work for me full time. Uh, like I said, seven figure business, getting a lot of really good results for people dealing with things in a creative manner, always legal, always compliant, but uh, there are ways to, to juggle things and, and ways that people can have more freedom in their life. That's great. Um, awesome. Yeah. I noticed you also have a podcast too. So you're, you're a busy guy. You're, you're doing a lot with this stuff, traveling around the world. So you figured out how to navigate this uh, expat stuff through traveling around the world. If you traveled through all these countries ever since you were basically like, a, like in your late teens. So, Correct. um, so yeah. Okay. So when did it click for you to, okay, so now you, you, you don't have to just stick to like the, the rules from your country as far as like the taxes you can kind of you know figure out another way so i was doing this right from when i was a teenager i was playing around with things that you know just trying things with different retirement accounts and sheltering funds and then being overseas and traveling and backpacking or digital nomad which what we now call digital nomad back in 20 some odd years ago that didn't really exist but um you know, just trial and error. Uh, add to that, the majority of my friends these days are lawyers. So I've been very fortunate in my life and had a lot of mentors who've been very generous with their time. Uh, I've also read over 2000 books on the subject. So uh, for a dyslexic, that uh, uh, is quite a change from what they told me I can and cannot do with my life. So incredible. Um, okay. So now for 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 traders like uh, like we know about Puerto Rico like Puerto Rico has a uh, what's it called act 60 it used to be act 20 act 22 Correct. you know about these things so like um and that's so that's what we know because you can keep the citizenship and move and uh and move to Puerto Rico for that but there's also I've noticed like um when I in in Puerto Rico I started noticing a lot about the British Virgin Islands you got the Cayman Islands you got St. Kitts. St. Kitts is very interesting, uh, just as an observation for me, because like I, I heard through you know through word of mouth or is uh, it's like a white collar hangout or something like that. So like it gets shady in some areas, but there's just so many rules. I've I've known some people that have like bank accounts in Panama. You got like uh, I know some traders that are in Singapore. Singapore is beautiful. Um, as far as like the modern architecture and all that. And, uh, you know, I think like you spit on the sidewalk there, you go to jail. Um, what do you got? I was in Dubai, Dubai, you know, is another, in another one. It's like traders consider to live there. You know, it's like for, for, and if you're doing really well, you live there for like six months and you live six months somewhere else because it gets way too hot. Um, so like, what, what do you think is, is, a is a popular destination, um, for traders that are flexible, you know what I mean? And like, for like cost of living, quality of life, uh, you know, because you've been around the world so much and, and you know, so, yeah. yeah your take so, on that. All right. Well, a couple of comments. I used to live in Singapore. I lived there for a year. So I know and understand that country very well. I lived in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, which is Dubai and Abu Dhabi. I lived there for eight years and I'm currently in Panama right now. I've been here for the last three years. What people are going to be wanting to look for are territorial tax systems or countries that have zero income tax and very little capital gains tax. So, you know, these countries in Europe are going to be very difficult. A lot of countries in Europe and Asia are going to be very difficult, but there's certain ones in the Caribbean, Central America, Latin America that fit the bill or the GCC, which is the UAE. Um, there's some of the neighboring countries that will also participate in uh, low tax scheme countries. And then Singapore, which you mentioned as well. So it's really about understanding the tax system of the country. Now, a couple of caveats before we get too far down the rabbit hole in taxation. Nothing I am saying today is individual tax advice for anybody listening or even for yourself. I'd be really remiss to give any advice on a podcast without knowing the full scope of the situation. And everything we do, I always have in the lawyer or a licensed professional, a CPA, sign off on any of the things that we do. But um, there are 
plans or, or strategies that you can use, even as an American, to legally reduce your tax bill. You have to understand that as an American, you have a legal obligation to pay taxes and file a tax return on your worldwide income, no matter where you live in the world. It's called citizenship-based taxation. There's only two countries in the world that do it. Number one is, uh, or one of them is Eritrea in Africa, which is known for blatant human rights violations. And the second is the United States. So you can kind of take that uh, how you like on how their taxation works and, and, and what is involved in that. I am not an American citizen. I'm a Canadian citizen, uh, as well as others. But as a Canadian citizen, things are considerably easier. In Canada, you leave the country, you file a final tax return, you tell them that you're going, you have a residency somewhere else, and you leave. And once your final tax return is done, you never pay taxes again, as long as you stay within the confines of that, and you're not you know, showing strong ties or physical presence back to Canada. Um, then you're done. Most of Western countries work this way. The US, you're still going to have to file. So Puerto Rico is a legal way through Act 60 to reduce your taxation. It's not a program that I work with all that much. The main reason is it's still going to cost you about $15,000 a year between your donation and your fees and all of these types of things. Not so bad if you're a single guy, but if you have a spouse and they also need to go through it, then it's a double. So you know, you can figure $30,000 a year. A program that I really like instead is called the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, F-E-I-E. -E. And I encourage your listeners to go and look it up on the IRS website. It's completely legal. It's a, it's a scheme by the IRS, which will allow you to shelter your first 112,000 US dollars from income tax. Now, if you have a spouse and they're also American, it's a doubling effect. So now you're talking just under $225,000 where you're not paying taxation on it. Now, as a trader, you know we need to juggle, okay, this is capital gains, it's not regular income. But if you're a professional trader and you structure things correctly, I think we could probably make an argument that this is what you do for a career. So you know, there might be different ways to skin the cat on that one, but we would wanna sit down and really look at someone's individual situation and then with the lawyer or with the CPA and go through it. So first of all, does that, all of that make sense? And is that kind of uh, paint a picture of, of what is out there in the world and how it fits together? Uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, you laid it out pretty clear. Now the F-E-I-E, -E, I'll have that in the notes, uh, you know, a general link. But okay, so you that you said was one hundred and twelve thousand dollars can be what what how how do what do you what, how do you handle that like if, so it's the, yeah earned income so if there's a couple of caveats that need to go in and we can break down the FEIE because I think it is a a valuable strategy or a valuable tool in the toolbox so first of all it has to be foreign. So it's the foreign earned income exclusion, meaning you can't be inside the United States. You need to be outside. You need to be foreign. Okay. okay? It needs to be earned income. So if it's just a passive income, um, you have a rental program, a rental property, or it's interest or, you know, on a bank account, those things are not going to qualify. But if you're earning the income, if you're doing it for a living, then it's going to work. Um, to qualify, there's two ways that you can qualify. One is called the physical presence test. The other is called the bona fide residency test. We usually like to do the physical presence test first. It's 330 days in a, in a foreign country. This means not in international waters. This means not on a sailboat out there uh, sailing around the world or on an airplane traveling be between countries. It means your feet on the ground inside a foreign country for a minimum of 330 days. So it's objective it's mathematics so this is like Second, for digital nomads kind of kind of deal well it can be digital nomads can be um expats as well Ex i mean okay. if you're living in another country then this works the second one is called the bona fide residency test and we usually do that on year two and that means we're going to do really strong ties to another country and have a residency a legal right to live and work in that country and uh, with that, it would allow you to spend a little bit more time in the United, back home in the United States. Um, but it's a very good program. It's usually the one that I'm looking at with my clients at the very beginning. And then from there, there are additional things that we can look at 
which are pretty advanced. We won't get into them, into them today, but there's foreign tax credits, there's housing allowance, there's other tools in the toolbox. But the FEIE, I think, is a good good starting point for a lot of people. Excellent, excellent. Um, great. So, so you mentioned some some countries uh re- recently on like your I think your podcast or your I saw it somewhere in one of your vlogs or something like that about like South and you mentioned it too about uh South America. You mentioned Nicaragua, um, Panama. You're in Panama, so like some other countries. How about like Brazil, for example, um, or you know, or yeah, just some some opportunities there. I find those really sure. interesting because um it's like similar to puerto rico you know at least the culture you know so it's well, language brazil is okay i know brazil very well first of all i've lived in brazil um my son was born in brazil we did birth tourism so we flew down to brazil while my wife was pregnant gave birth in the country and because the child was born there he's automatically a citizen and we did what's called or we're doing what's called the family reunification visa because we're the legal guardian of a Brazilian citizen. We get our permanent residency there as well. Now, Brazil is not a tax haven country whatsoever. It is a tax hell country. Um, I would never recommend it for that avenue. It is also a very bureaucratic country. um, And remitting funds in and out of the country is very difficult. For a lifestyle point of view, Brazil is amazing. Brazilians are some of the coolest people on planet Earth and have a really rich culture, amazing music and food, and the language is fantastic, and I really love it, and I spend so much time with Brazilians, like a ridiculous amount of time. But um, So I do help people with going down to Brazil, but not for tax reasons at all. Mm -hmm. I see, and I bring that up because uh, I I was in Brazil... uh... 2020 actually late late to 2020 in the middle of the, in the height of the pandemic mm-hmm. and um i i noticed some people were like looking to buy citizenship or some something like that there and uh yeah they do a residency by investment it's a two hundred thousand dollars it's done in local currency but you can say roughly two hundred thousand us they don't do a citizenship program there you need to spend a certain amount of time which is you know depending on your situation can be mm-hmm. one year like one to two years, like my situation, or it could be five years if you were just going in as an investor. Gotcha. So, so what about like countries like like Panama and Nicaragua that you mentioned? First of all, Nicaragua, I was surprised to see it there because uh, growing up in Miami, I had some friends that, that were Nicarag- Nicaraguense, and um, they their families were escaping like uh, some social, some economic and social unrest over there, say socialism or communism or whatever. Um, so yeah, how's that now? And, and what about, uh, Panama? You want to talk about Panama? Sure. I can talk about both countries. So Nicaragua has a pretty tragic past. There's no question about that. However, you're, when we send people to Nicaragua, we're not sending them to go and rely on the public sector or send their kids to the local schools or work a local job. These are usually independently wealthy people or business owners or, you know, people who have online businesses or investments or things like that. So it's a really different situation then. Nicaragua was also pretty much, you know, between Mexico, Nicaragua, and Brazil, you can argue, you know, between the three, but these were the three most open and free countries over the last two years, you know, like no lockdowns, no mask mandates, no vaccine mandates, like life was good in these three places. You can't say that about everywhere in the world. That's for sure. I'm from Canada. You can't say that about Canada at all. Yeah. Um, that's why I went. That's why I went to Brazil, by the way. That's why I was. <laughs> I that's why we went to Brazil as well. <laughs> we were in Floripa in the south of Brazil. It was yeah. like COVID. What? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw there. that on the news or something. Yeah, that's important to know. Oh, yeah. OK, so, yeah, what were you saying? So Nicaragua is a good option. They also have a residency program, which is very affordable. Uh, we just did a podcast interview that just went live today actually on it on getting uh, residency in nicaragua through an agroforestry investment and the price point is very very low very affordable and nicaragua is a territorial tax system so if your money is made outside of the country they don't care about it they won't tax you in that country so that's pretty attractive um 
Nicaragua is actually statistically the safest country in South America. Most people think it's really dangerous. It's actually the most safe out of all the, the seven countries here. So that's interesting. Um, I think it's a great plan B option. It's a good residency to keep in your back pocket, especially because it's very cheap. Uh, Panama is a great plan A destination. Panama is a place where you can really have a viable life here. There's tons of awesome people here, expats and locals. The people are very well-educated, well-spoken. Uh, there's a lot of money here. There's amazing restaurants and food. All the infrastructure is here. They've got one of the largest banking sectors in the world. Uh, great medical facilities, good options for investment, for residencies. Um, you know, we spend the majority of the year in Panama right now. We travel and we go overseas and things as well. But Panama is, is a very strong place for a plan A. Um, the uh, residency option here, they've got many different types, but the most popular one is a $200,000 real estate investment. And this will get you a temporary residency. And then after two years, you can upgrade it to a permanent residency. And after five years after that, you can get your citizenship here. And there's a lot of advantages. I mean, I'm going out with just private clients, not even my, all the listeners from the podcast, not even all of my subscribers on my newsletter, just private clients on Friday. And I've got over 40 people confirmed for going out for dinner. So there's a lot of people here uh, in Panama City. Wow, excellent. So so what is the general uh, way to go about this? You got to like renounce your citizenship first and then like make your way to to like get the permanent residency with the big investment or real estate or some or purchase or something like that. And then work your way to the citizenship. Is that the way to go about it? Or can you keep American citizenship and and uh, and go about doing this? You can absolutely keep your American citizenship as an American. You can have a residency in another country. There is no problem with that whatsoever. Americans also allow dual nationality, so you can get a second passport in another country. There's no restrictions on that. Now, if you hold foreign assets, there's going to be reporting requirements. There's certain forms that you're going to need to fill in, and your CPA or your, your um, tax advisor would be able to prepare those for you. Or you might want to work with a professional like me, You know, maybe H&R Block down the street. They wouldn't know and understand this. But if you work with someone who is internationally minded, they would know. But no, you don't have to renounce your U.S. citizenship by any means. Now, the, the reason the reason why I mentioned the renouncing is because, like, if if you if you keep your American citizenship, you still have to pay all the all the taxes uh, like you would in the states, right? So this is what we were talking about before. You still have to file. You still have to pay taxes on anything that you're that you owe. But when you file, you fill out a form, the FEIE that we discussed earlier, I see. which you're not going to be required to pay taxes on that foreign sourced income for the first 200, or, sorry, 112,000, 224,000 if you're a married couple. So okay. that does a lot. Now, if you're really talking about a ton of money, like you're a really high net worth individual, uh, you can renounce your US citizenship. I recommend not telling them that you're renouncing because you're doing it for tax reasons. They really would not like that whatsoever. And I'm, I'm not advising you to do that. But it is something that happens all the time. And there are many documented cases of people who are renouncing for this reason. You know, it's probably outside of the, com uh, the this conversation on how that functions and the difference between a covered expatriate and a, and a non-covered expatriate. But, you know, these are things that I help my private clients with every time, uh, every day. So if you guys went to expatmoney.com, you'll be able to fill out an application form there if you want to, you know, work with me and get a little bit more one-on-one uh, -on -one advice, you could say. I got you. Okay, so the goal is... Uh for dual citizenship otherwise than what we what we just mentioned so working your way to dual citizenship is probably um you know what, what you're trying to do so like okay so the same thing like for dubai right because when i was in dubai um i was looking at a property there like i have a background in architecture and i saw like a a really notable architect that passed away like she, she zaha hadid she made um a limited that. amount of works and, and she made this last piece of work and uh of a, a unit was available in there and it was actually pretty affordable because it's a very small unit and um i was thinking man how would i make this work if i were if i were to buy this you know and then 
they were telling me that um of course the the realtors on site and all that you could talk to them they say oh yeah don't worry once you buy this you you become like a permanent resident right away because you, you bought this and uh you know they're help, trying to help make the sale of course but um but how would that work hypothetically if i if i were to go about that buy this million dollar property or whatever over there and um and now i got permanent residency in dubai uh, how how would i navigate all that yeah so there's no income tax in that country right now so it is a good country for doing a lot of these things as i said i lived there for eight years i left three years ago and i have i have certain reasons for for leaving i do think it's a good country and i think that they have a lot to offer but there are certain reasons people might not want to do it there are many different residency options for the UAE. Usually they're based around forming a company um, and using uh, different structures to go about that. They can get expensive and you need to know that you need to visit the country at least once every six months to keep your visa active. And when you compare that to a place like Panama, which is only one day every two years, it just gives you a lot more flexibility over here. Wait, now, can you can you repeat that? So you, you only have yeah. to be in Panama one day out of two years? Is that what you just said? Yep. Wow. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Wow, that's really, really good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know you're traveling and you're digital nomad, or you want to live overseas, or you change your mind, or you want to keep your visa active, then you know, one day every two years is pretty easy. Yeah. One day every six months is like okay, I really need to go there. I really need to fly there. I really need to make a, a commitment to this um, to keep it active. If you're going to move there, then it doesn't really matter. Then it's it's fine. But what they want you doing is living in the country and spending your money there. I mean, that that's the economic activity. That's why they set these types of things. But um, UAE is a good country. Uh, I used to do trading. I don't trade anymore, but I'd start trading at 5 p.m. and I'd finish at, you know, one o'clock in the morning or something like that. Now, when my first child was born and, you know, she's up at 6 30, 7 o'clock in the morning and daddy needs to sleep until midday or 1 p.m., uh, you know, I didn't really like that very much. So it was one of the reasons that I left. I like being on Eastern Standard Time or, or Central Time, you know, something like that where it's very, very easy to work on this front. But yeah. Wow. Awesome. And, um, and what about Singapore? You mentioned Singapore. Is Singapore similar to Dubai? So Singapore has does have taxation there, but it's a territorial tax system. The tax system is pretty good. They have a very conservative banking sector, very, very strong banking. A lot of people call it the Switzerland of Asia. A lot of people put their money there. Uh, very strong in the precious metals field. They have a residency program, but it's really expensive. Off the top of my head, I think it's $1.5 million. Um, you know, that's a serious chunk of change that you're going to need to uh, invest in the country. Now, we usually use Singapore more for structuring and banking, but not from the residency side. And even if you did get the residency and you eventually wanted to get citizenship, they don't allow dual nationality there. So you would have to give up your citizenship. I actually have a client right now who we're doing his Singaporean citizenship and we have to renounce his US citizenship. So we're literally working through that right now. And it's a pain in the butt. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of work, you know? And but, uh, uh, it can be worth it file for the right person. Gotcha. And then also what just popped in my head, I know some people, because I was about to t start uh, intro talking about uh, switching over to foreign investments. And I remember a few years ago, um, there was a lot of buzz about like uh, investing in Colombia. Uh, and then now like there's going to be a new president, so it might turn socialist. And so now like uh, it's it's a little fuzzy what's going on there. So so what do you what, last thoughts on 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 uh, on Colombia, maybe before we talk a little bit about foreign investments? What do you think? Uh, because you're in Panama, so I'm sure, you know, probably got more insight on uh, it's closer it's right around the corner kind of yeah they they elected petro and i mean he's an ex guerrilla farc fighter and a socialist and we'll see what happens he doesn't have the majority so i don't think that there's going to be so much that he's going to be able to do he ran on some pretty kooky campaign promises my instinct tells me that he's not going to be able to fulfill a lot of those uh, it is a shame that another country is leaning more socialist. I'm 
very much against this. We're seeing the same with Brazil as well. We're going to see Bolsonaro probably lose in the upcoming election and Lula get back in. And he's a hardcore socialist as well as a convicted felon. So wow, that's yeah. not great. Um, you know, I don't really have too much to say about it. Colombia has a residency program. I've been going to Colombia on and off for over 20 years now. I love it there. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. The lifestyle is amazing. Medellin is one of the most beautiful cities you will ever go to on planet Earth with some of the greatest people in the world. Um, really tragic history of what's happened over the last 30, 40 years, but fantastic people who live there and an amazing story and amazing uh, resilience of the people there. So I, I like Colombia. Um, I think it's good to have a residency there. It's not so expensive. They have a program that comes in at about 80,000 for a temp residency and 160,000 for a permanent residency. Um, and it can be invested in anything in the country, but I'm cautiously watching what's happening right now. I'm not necessarily moving all of my clients there, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to mention also, I wanted to ask you, so I have a friend that, for example, that went, that moved to Puerto Rico, but used to be in Colombia and had a property in Colombia and was getting like, um, I was renting it out, uh, while he was in Puerto Rico, he didn't sell his property in, in Colombia. And he had a lot of trouble trying to get the money from Colombia out of Colombia, like to like you make you're renting a property in Colombia, you're collecting money for the rent, but you can't get the rent money to, you, to any you can't get it out of the country. This is very hard to and he just wanted to get rid of the property so you don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, you know, is 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 that in particular to Colombia or are there are a lot of little way a lot of little nuances when when you have yeah, investments remitting like Remitting funds can be difficult anywhere in the world. It's dependent on the country and how it's sourced and were you paying taxes on it and many things. Uh, you know, I don't know his particular situation, so I can't really comment on it. But uh, there's usually ways that you can navigate this stuff legally. I got you. Okay. So, and then, okay. So then briefly, you want to uh, touch on like foreign investments and how, okay. So we talked about like, you know, getting permanent residency to go towards citizenship and uh, you talk F E I E and, um, and these kind of things, but what about like investing to investments? Sure. I, because I did trade for many years, I was trading derivatives and I did very well for seven years on that. I, I blew up my account, which I'm sure many people on your podcast have probably done at some point in their lives, I blew things up pretty bad. And uh, I decided that that was not something I wanted to do much more in my life. And I've really turned now into more tangible assets. So I deal a lot with real estate. I deal a lot with precious metals, with agricultural land, with farmland, with timber, with these types of things. Uh, I'm looking for really conservatively managed things. Um, I want to have the title deed. I want to have full ownership. I want to have full control over it. I want to make sure that it can't be inflated or manipulated or Federal Reserve step in. That's how I am now after going through this for many, many, many years. Uh, that's how I look at investing. I also have two beautiful children who I love and adore and a wife that I need to care for and a mother that I care for as well. So I'm very conservative with all of my investments and I don't really do uh, anything speculative anymore uh, because that's just the phase that I'm in in my life. But when I was young and I was investing overseas, I would take a lot more risks than I do now. I got you. So, but like uh, the, the country, a lot of these countries that you mentioned are, are, are uh, you know, uh, ripe with uh, some like real estate investments and things like that. Like, you know, it's because it's a, uh, you know, the economy is stable and it's not like, like Colombia, I wouldn't want to invest in Colombia if, if uh, the situation was more dire and then all of a sudden your stuff gets taken. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't think that we're going to see government confiscation of, of properties or anything like that. I don't think Colombia is going to turn into Venezuela. Um, same in Nicaragua. People have asked this. I don't think that's going to happen whatsoever. You know, I think it's a lot of fear mongering from people who are trying to push you one direction or another. That's not my style. That's not who I am as a person. I try to give an as objective 
overview of things and try to be realistic and pragmatic about these things. Um, I do like investing overseas. Um, for example, I deal with a company here in Panama that does turnkey investments. They rent out to the multinational companies. So what happens is we've got the Panama Canal here and they send down their executives who work uh, for the Panama Canal. So they might send down um, you know, an executive for six months and this might be you know, GE or Procter & Gamble or one of the motor companies or something like this. Well, they need somewhere for that person to live. So, you know, they'll put them in the old Trump Towers or they'll put them in the U building or they'll put them in one of these really fancy places. But the company doesn't want to own the property and they don't want to do the maintenance on it. So I work with a company that does property management and they've got 500 units or something that they control here. And you can expect, this is not a promise, not a guarantee, I'm not selling anything, but probably five to 6% annual return cash on cash on your money. That's not going to make you a millionaire tomorrow, but the property is going to keep up with inflation or should keep up with inflation. It's a little bit of cash in your bank account, but on top of that, it now qualifies you for residency in the country, which is the work that I really do. We want to protect our money, protect the downside, wealth protection, and get you a residency or a citizenship somewhere else. So it's kind of the these combinations of a few different things that I like to mash together and and really how I look at investment these days. Well, that's great. So, okay, so people can um, reach out to you to find out more about those little you know, ways to navigate it because the way you just mentioned makes perfect sense. So you have a, a an investment that keeps up with inflation, give you some change in your pocket, and you qualify for um, citizenship. Eventually. For residency, for residency, for residency, residency. Yeah. And then, you know, you you get your foot in the door for future citizenship. You know, correct. Yeah. Opportunities. Great. So yeah. So you're 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 the guy for that to to know how to do that kind of stuff. Okay. Cool. So um, thank you so much, Michael, for for laying that all out. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna get a lot of uh value from this because I know it's something that we all we as a community we always think about, but like it takes a lot of energy to kind of know about it so maybe getting in touch with a professional like you um is is the way to go about this so yeah thank you so much for coming on the podcast and taking the time for that absolutely and if people want to check out my podcast you guys can look it up on your favorite podcasting app it's called the expat money show i encourage you to do that we've been going for six years now so over 200 episodes um, I encourage you to listen to that. You can also go to expatmoney.com. If you guys want one-on-one -on -one help, then there's a big orange button in the right-hand corner that says work with us. And I have a, a letter there. I would like you to read it, read it carefully. Don't do it on your mobile phone. Don't just glance on it. You need to really go through it and, uh, and understand, but there's an application form at the end. I will be very upfront. My prices are not cheap. I don't work with cheap people. Um, but if you need real help and, and this means a lot to you, then, uh, then I'm happy to help out and take care of your audience. Okay. Perfect. Well, Michael, thanks again. And I'll have all that in notes. So check the notes for all that and, uh, yo, keep in touch, Michael. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks, David.